Hey, welcome back to the channel. So, it's been a while since I've uploaded a video. I've had been busy, so between work and then I've decided to change things up a bit. So for a while I've been contemplating on getting a suppressor for the rifle. The reason being is Suppressors are great. I've shot rifles with suppressors on. I've shot several. They're fantastic. I love them. They're awesome. The one thing that was keeping me from pulling the trigger is a lot of these suppressors, you don't know for sure if they're going to work on your rifle. They're going to work, but to your standards. So that coupled with the price, coupled with the wait time. It is a long, I mean, long wait time. I mean, we're talking, some people are taking six months, nine months to get their suppressors and tax stamps. You know, you're looking at paying a lot of money. So, what I did was, thanks to a good buddy of mine, uh, he knows this stuff, especially with suppressors. He told me about Form 1. So form one is a different type of ATF form. Your standard suppressors that people would buy through a company or a dealer is a form four, which is like transferring. A form one is making a firearm or suppressor is what it is. You're making a firearm part in a general statement, pretty much. So there's companies that have kits. Or you could just build your own. You just gotta submit the form, pay your tax stamp, two hundred dollars, the same fee, and then send in the paperwork, send in fingerprints. You do your own fingerprints, send them in. The turnaround time is roughly a month. Mine only took two and a half weeks, and it was approved. So I decided to do that. And this is what I did with it. Rifle over. So, you guys remember it? Looks the same. Except for that. Big suppressor. So, as you can see, it's got engraving here. It's got my name, serial number. That's another cool thing you do is. When you submit that paperwork and you can electronic file it you don't have to mail it in you can but you can e-file you have to give the information you know there's videos on it so not too many details it's cheaper way cheaper um, there's kits that aren't they're over half the price less than the actual name brand suppressors from companies. And then you can tune it, make it quieter, you know. So I like that, and it's quicker. That was the main thing, it was quicker, and it's just as good, if not better, than some of the other companies out there. I'm not saying this beats all companies, blah, blah, blah. I'm just saying it is good, and you can make it better if you do enough research and you have qualified people who know what they're doing, make modifications and adjust the internals. And by those people, I mean you. It's not that hard to do, it's pretty cool. Um, it's a lot of extra work, but I went that route because of the fact that I can adjust it. I did my research on it before I filed my paperwork, before I decided what kit to go with. I did a lot of research on it. I did about, uh, about a week about a week of research and now I'm not talking about a few minutes each day I'm talking about most of my free time each day I was looking up more information and comparing notes and everything and contacting companies contacting people and people that did this stuff because I never owned a suppressor I don't know enough I know a basic part and I've learned a lot so I got it done and then once I got the approval I finished 
drilling and boring out my baffles and the end cap. So now I can do that because I have the approved form from the APF saying you are approved and it is serialized and has my name and serial number. It's documented. It's all legal. It's all legal. So. Got done with that. Then I turned around and decided, well, I'm going to test it out. Took my hand load that I had when I had the tuner brake on, this thing, which is still phenomenal. I, I love this thing. I do. I really do. I really do. I still love it. Suppressors are phenomenal, though. I love sound suppression. I don't have to wear ear pearls, even with this Magnum, I don't. It's, I have shot a couple of ARs that have suppressors on it that were louder and left a little small ring in my ear. This does not at all. Is it because maybe I have a long ass barrel? Possibly. So, I did that. And then quiet it down, took it to the range. I increased my muzzle velocity by about 40 feet per second, give or take. And then I wanted to see at the same time if this Winchester Stable 6.5 powder is more consistent than the Norma MRP powder I had in it. With the Norma MRP with 10 shots, at the load I had it on, it was roughly I don't know, 14 feet per second standard deviation. So yeah, sorry about that. I had to pause it. Had delivery show up. Standard deviation of 14.2 feet per second over 10 shots with the normal load. That's so. That's not bad. That's okay. I want mine below 10 for long range. So, did the 6.5 load setup, and I did the same load development process as I do with everything. I actually had three primers to choose and use for the 10 shots for the pressure on velocity powder node so I still I have a good amount of CCI 34s federal gold metal matched large rifle magnum primers and then I found some uh, CCI bench rest large rifle primers that I had left over I had a good amount to where I thought if it worked out I'd have enough to make it through the hunting season so I tested those out and the CCI 34 primers performed phenomenally with the 6.5 stay ball. So I made notes here. So right there in that red bracket, 62.1 grains to 63 grains. I had a extreme spread. Of 14 feet per second across 0.9 grains. 14 feet per second extreme spread. That is awesome. Now, I can jump for joy. I'm saying that's that is great. You can't just rely off of this, but this gives you, hey, this is where your node is. It's in this area. So I've never had that happen yet with this 300 short mag out of all the load development I have done even with my 6.5 PRT I haven't had a load development where it was across that wide of a powder charge that my node was with the velocity not altering it was staying consistent so that's good it's the lowest was 2839 and the highest was 2853 feet per second. So I'm right around that 2850 mark, 2845. 
which is fine. That's good. That's 50 feet per second above what my bare minimum was for this rifle build, shooting the 208 grain AMAX bullets for stability. For those 208 grain AMAXs with a 10 twist rifle, you want to have at least 2,800 feet per second to have that optimum um, stability. If you go a little bit above it, that's fine. You might, you'll increase BC, but they, anyways, yeah, there's a formula for it. It's called the CULP formula, if you look it up, C-U-L-P, and it involves taking the weight of your bullet, the length of it, um, and plugging in a velocity, at least your velocity goal. Um, and then it'll spit out an answer that is your twist, the optimum twist rate for it. And 2,800 feet per second, mine came out at like 10.1 something, whatever. So that's 10.1 twist barrel. So that's what I used to determine my barrel that I was going to get for this rifle build. So my velocity is good and it is that consistent. That is awesome. Now granted, my average velocity with the Norma MRP powder that I had previously loaded before I got the suppressor averaged 2,883 feet per second. But like I said, my standard deviation was 14 feet per second off 10 shots which isn't bad, but like I said, I want to get it better. And with a wider node like this, where it is that obvious that, hey, there's a node there, across 0.9 grains, you only have a spread of 14 feet per second, I can get it lower. I want the widest node possible, and my velocity is okay. I'm sacrificing maybe 20, 30 feet per second, we'll see. Or about 30 feet per second, yeah. That doesn't bother me any. It is what it is. Even with 2850, let's say, is the velocity it comes out to. It would be around 2850. At 1,000 yards, I plugged in the data. My muzzle, the energy, the kinetic energy at 1,000 yards is still over 1,400 feet per second. Or, sorry. The velocity is over 1,800 feet per second. The kinetic energy is over 1400 foot pounds of kinetic energy at a thousand yards that is more than enough to drop it out because i got elk coming up so <laughs> so now my goal is to tune this to get this as accurate as i can with the smallest groups possible so next step is i'm going to just load 15 rounds next and keep in mind I just fired under 30 I think I fired 28 because the other primers just didn't stand out so now I'll do my seating depth test um, and I made notes too so my case to base O jive the base to O jive when I did the powder test, pow the primer powder test was 2.214 inches. So following Eric Cortina's method, which I believe is a fast track to get you to where you find your very accurate load and precise load for long distance for anything. So the next step is the seating depth test in the middle of the more than likely node we're not saying 100% that is the node, but that's definitive, but that is your node. We're not saying that right there in the middle of it is where you have to be. So seating depth test, three thousandths increments, shooting deeper, three shot groups. I got five, um, five measurements. So 2.211 inches all the way to two, or sorry, 2.211 to 2.199 inches um, case to base the case base to O jive measurement three shot groups with 62.5 grains of 6.5 stay ball which is the middle of the more than likely node 
and hopefully in that I will either be in the seeding depth mode or just start to get into it so either way I'm gonna hopefully see some results with this um, I'm hoping to see some really good results so and once I do then I will load to that seeding depth the longest measurement where it goes starts to go into the node minus that by a thousandth of an inch variation for your seeding depth consistency with your dies and your press you always take that into account I'm not going to go into full detail and explain why Eric Cortina has done that wonderfully he's a great guy and he is very very smart and he's no nonsense straightforward and very helpful so I brought the tuner I bought the tuner brake and I am amazed by it so and then once my seating depth's done then I'm going to revisit this note I will load up and this is where extreme spread I'm not relying on it saying oh yeah my extreme spread is really low that makes me worry that's yeah extreme spread can show you a bad charge it's not good it's not the best at showing a good charge or powder charge but it is good at showing a bad one so I'll be loading going in both directions lower and higher roughly half a grain to maybe 0.6 grains both directions I'll shoot three shots a piece and check my extreme spreads for each set of shots um, I double check my grouping to make sure it's still grouping good and then once I find the one that has a low extreme spread then what I'll or if I have a couple of them in a row that are really good I'll load to the middle of it again and this time I'll load up 10 rounds and shoot all 10 of those over the chronograph and find the standard deviation 10 rounds is good for standard deviation standard deviation is the best way to find your long range precision load when it comes to the velocity um, I'm not talking about grouping um, at 100 yards I'm talking about long range um, accuracy uh, standard deviation is your best route I use both extreme spread and standard deviation for their best benefits extreme spread in lower round counts to determine a bad one um, if one looks good doesn't have a high extreme spread I'll further look into that and fire more rounds I'll fire 10 total rounds then um, to get standard deviation and from here on out once I find a good one that has good standard deviation I will still continue to collect data even down the road let's say a month down the road I'll still log that data um, that's the best part about the magneto speed is you can archive your information and it'll keep keep it stored and eventually you could load up and get to like 50 shots recorded and have a very very accurate standard deviation and average muzzle velocity it's over time the, I mean I do a lot of jumping around but people jump around until they found, find something that really draws them and it is clear as day that hey this works this is good so so that's it for now um, I didn't record any of the range footage today it was pretty hot I was just trying to get it done uh, but tomorrow I'll be heading back out again and we will be doing the seating depth test I might even hook up the uh, probably hook up the phone scope adapter to my spotting scope and show those in real time so that way nobody thinks it's BS but also um, it feels it would be good to show the information uh, the audio won't do it any justice granted I'm recording this from my phone still you know I'm just getting back into the YouTube stuff and people are saying I should be showing this stuff and 
how I do this process. Um, it's not that easy. I'm not that much of a recording type person. I'm more of an in-person trainer with firearms and training and precision. I'm more of an in-person hands-on guy. So if it seems awkward, it's just whatever. It's, I'm not used to it. I don't do it normally. Um, I'm just trying to get the point across as best as I can. Um, so more people are more visual learners. So I try to show that as much as I can. But by going through a quick explanation, maybe it can give a better understanding. And then me pointing you in the right direction with go check this out if you want more information. Because this is just what I'm doing. I'm not saying this is the method. I'm just saying this is what I've come to understand and what I found works best for me. Um, and it has worked. Um, I'm not saying don't do anybody else. That's why I say if you like what I'm doing and how I'm getting to these results and this information, that's why I point you to these individuals like Eric Cortina, um, Modern Day Sniper, for them for shooting methods and fundamentals. Phenomenal. Phil Vallejo and Kalen Logic. I mean, geez. It's simple, straightforward, and it's awesome. Same thing with Eric Cortina. So, Eric Cortina on the reloading side of it. Um, on the sh actual shooting side of it, I incorporate modern day sniper. See what I mean? So, that's it for now. Catch you guys tomorrow. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that bell icon for notifications. Um, yeah, I'll catch you guys on the flip side. So, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep doing it. So elk season's right around the corner, and then deer season's about two weeks after it. So I'm ready. I'm going to take you guys with me on that too. So be ready. I'm going to try getting better at this video stuff and vlogging type deal and YouTube stuff. I'm going to try to. I like doing this stuff. I love doing this out there. I got told I should probably get this out there. And if people that know me that have subscribed to this channel in the Wyoming area, that's where I'm at. Feel free, want to get together, maybe do some practice, some training, get together. I'm all down for it. So, great time. So, remember, be safe, shoot straight, have fun. Catch you next time.